Yep, <laughs> good. Uh, that was a children, obviously, a children's version of an overview of 1 Samuel 16 to 20, which, which gives a good, quick, summarized bit of background to the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, which is 1 Samuel 20. So it's all about this well-known story of David and Jonathan, and particularly their friendship, which is really what we're going to, to be looking at this morning. Uh, it's a passage that I think is actually appropriate for Waitangi Day, and we'll find that out as, as we get into it. So let's listen in on the, on the earnest conversation between David and Jonathan after, after David had just escaped several attempts on his life by Jonathan's father, King Saul. I hear a little bit of echo up here, Ben. So David was convinced that King Saul wanted him dead. And it seemed pretty obvious to him because Saul had tried to kill him on several occasions um, and they just seemed to be getting more and more frequent and he'd, had to, he'd only just been able to escape with his life um, on some of these attempts on his life. Jonathan, however, couldn't believe that his dad would ever do such a thing. How could, he, could his dad want to kill his very best friend? He couldn't believe it. So let me read to you from 1 Samuel 20, 12 to 17, which lies at the heart of this passage we're going to be looking at this morning. Then Jonathan said to David, I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed toward you, will I not send your word, send you word and let you know? But if my father intends to harm you, May the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be, be killed. I think I've got another slide in there. Ah, which is not showing up for some reason, so I'll read it to you. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies into account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. This is God's word to us today that we're going to look at, and I trust that by his spirit at work in each of us, he's going to apply it to our lives so that we can put what he wants us to be putting into practice out of this today. Now, changing tactics a little, some of you may or may not remember an old television advertisement for super glue. I mean, everybody knows what super glue is. You've used it before, probably. But there's this... It's, it's not on TV at the moment, but, or it hasn't been on for a long, long time, but there's an old ad that shows um, them gluing two big metal pads together with super glue. One pad is attached to a harness around an elephant, and the other part is a, of the pad is attached, or the other, other pad is attached to a crane. And once the bonds of the super glue has, has set, the crane then starts to pick up this elephant up off the ground, purely held together by, by the, the super glue gluing these two metal pads together. I haven't seen the ad for a long time on TV. Maybe it's an animal rights thing or something. I don't know. But, but it's, it demonstrates quite graphically the strength, the power, the bond of, of super glue. This morning we're going to examine a different kind of a super glue. The kind that solid friendships are bonded together by. The sort of friendship bond that David and Jonathan had for each other, according to 1 Samuel 20, as we're going to soon learn. We're going to examine their bond of friendship to find out what it was made of, because their friendship bond just might well teach us something about the bonds of friendship we make between one another, and that Jesus makes, or well, certainly wants to make, with you and me. Oh, there it was. I had it out of order. That was a slide I wanted to show you from the reading. So loving kindness was the main ingredient that bonded David and Jonathan together like super glue. Loving kindness is the super glue of their friendship. 
Back in chapter 18, Jonathan made a covenant with David. You can read it back there if you want to. Because he loved him, it says. Not romantically, it wasn't that kind of a love. But a love with which the closest of best friends care about each other. In recognition of their friendship bond, Jonathan had given his royal robe and tunic to David as a symbol that David, not he, would become the next king of Israel. Jonathan also had given his sword, his bow, and his belt to David as a sign that they would never be enemies because they were bound together with, with this loving kindness that they had for each other and nothing was going to pull them apart. But now their bond of friendship was being put to the test by Jonathan's father, King Saul, who tried killing David on, on several occasions. Not surprisingly, Jonathan couldn't believe his dad would ever do such a terrible thing. Surely David must be mistaken about this, he thought. In this moment of high tension between these closest of friends, David suggested a plan to prove once and for all whether King Saul really did want him dead or not. But it wasn't an easy plan for Jonathan to put into action because it required Jonathan to put his own relationship with his dad at great risk. Realizing his plan would be difficult for Jonathan to do, David reminded him of the covenant that they'd made together, cementing their friendship with loving kindness. David said to Jonathan, As for you, show kindness to your servant David, for you have brought me into a covenant with you before the Lord. You have brought me into a covenant with you before the Lord, he said. If I am guilty of doing something against your father, then kill me yourself, he said. Why hand me over to your father? You may as well be the one that kills me. Such was the seriousness of the situation. If the reason why Jonathan's dad was after him turned out to be that David had in fact sinned against King Saul. Yet Jonathan also realized that if indeed his dad was intent on killing his best friend David, then David would have to flee for his life. There'd be no other option for him at that point. So in return for carrying out David's plan, Jonathan asked him, if you have to flee because of my father, then show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed, said Jonathan to David. You see, in this exchange, this backwards and forwards between David and Jonathan, the friendship bonds of loving kindness are, are evident as bonds that go both ways. It wasn't just loving kindness that, that David expected of Jonathan. Jonathan expected loving kindness in return. They both were showing lo loving kindness for each other in this covenantal friendship relation that they had for each other. I wonder if you've ever made a, a commitment of loving kindness to someone that you care about, someone that you have a a deep friendship with, like David and Jonathan had for each other. I wonder if you've made that kind of, of promise, that kind of covenant, that commitment to each other that would be something like what they'd made to each other. Now, I wonder if you can remember the affirmation we made as a church at our last meeting back in Dece on December the 2nd. A wee while ago now. But we made it, those of you who were at that meeting, it was a Zoom meeting, it was a different kind of a meeting, but we were there together online, and we made an affirmation together. I think it was a kind of friendship covenant that we made between one another, because it expresses a commitment to showing loving kindness towards each other under the, cov under the COVID protection framework that could so easily put our friendships with each other to the test. And I know it is doing that, isn't it? It has done that with, with perhaps some of us. Um, we've had some, some stuff we've had to work through in our family where there's been some differing opinions there. And churches, many churches around the country are having huge tensions going on because of this COVID framework and the, the requirement of having um, vaccine passes if we're going to gather in numbers like we are today. Here is the church meeting affirmation again, just to remind you of it. Have a read of it. I'm not going to read it out to you. I'm going to pick up on some key points in a moment, but have a silent read of it.
So I've highlighted the parts of our affirmation that particularly express our commitment to loving kindness toward each other. So let me point them out to you. The first is not wanting anyone in the church to be adversely impacted by the government mandate. Not anyone. We don't want anyone to be adversely affected by it. It's a commitment of, of, or an affirmation of doing everything in our power to remain as, as one church, not breaking apart into different, different factions of it, but remaining together as one church in Jesus Christ. It's an affirmation of offering support to all who call the tabernacle their church home, which um, I, I would hope is all of you and, and all of you that are online on Zoom today and those who couldn't be here as well. And if it, it's an affirmation of following, um, of offering, of, of, the, of following the provisions of the COVID-19 protection framework for the sake of the health and safety of our church family and the vulnerable among us. And we do have vulnerable among us. Our children, our seniors, and those with health issues, for the sake of the common good is what we are affirming in this, this affirmation that we made at our last church meeting. Affirmations of loving kindness such as, the, as these, when put into practice, as David and Solomon did, bond our friendships together with, with loving kindness like superglue bonds uh, two things together when they are joined by that kind of a glue. So I want to ask you, how are you showing loving kindness to others in these testing times where friendships and relationships and church whanau and, and all of that are put to the test because of the, the present laws of our land? How has loving kindness been shown to you? Have you been the recipient of loving kindness being shown to you? Um, in, in some kind of a way relating to that affirmation that we've, we've made together. May we bond our friendships together with the super glue of loving kindness by putting our church meeting affirmation into action. May it not just become a, a thing that was written down and agreed to, but actually put into action, into practice, so that those bonds of loving kindness will continue to keep us well glued together as a church, a church of Jesus Christ. Now, if loving kindness is a friendship bond maker, then shame and entitlement are friendship bond breakers. And we see this in this passage of uh, 1 Samuel 20. Shame is what King Saul tried using to break the friendship bond between Jonathan and David after realising that Jonathan wasn't going to tell him where David really was. After listening to Jonathan's made-up explanation, and I guess Saul probably saw right through it, as to why David wasn't at the New Moon Feast for a second day in a row, Saul exploded in anger at him. You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, he said to him. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? These are strong words coming out of the mouth of Jonathan's dad. He was shaming Jonathan, or at least trying to shame him, into telling him where David was hiding. He was trying to pull their friendship apart in doing so. Then Saul tried appealing to Jonathan's sense of entitlement to become the next king of Israel because, because under with Saul as his dad, he was the, the next one in line to become king if it hadn't been for God intervening in that, that lineage. Don't you realize that as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established? Now send someone to bring him to me for he must die. Saul yelled at his very own son. Frustrated by his failed attempts to break David and Jonathan's bond of friendship with shame and entitlement, Saul angrily hurled a spear at his son. And thankfully, he missed. But David's plan had worked because now Jonathan knew for sure that his father indeed did want David dead. Jonathan was grieved by his father's shameful treatment of David. Nevertheless, with their friendship bond still intact, it hadn't been broken, Jonathan went to meet David the next day to tell him the bad news. You see, shame and privilege 
remain friendship breakers today, don't they? You might be able to think of instances where, where you've been in situations where shame and privilege and entitlement have been, been used to pull apart friendships, to manipulate people into doing something which they don't want to do. Think again of the affirmation that we made at our last church meeting that affirms our bonds of loving kindness together. Um, as we comply with this COVID protection framework that is, is testing those bonds of friendship together. How tempting it would be for those who are vaccinated, and I presume that's all of us here because we had to be vaccinated to get into church today. How tempting it would be for those who are vaccinated to shame those who haven't, for not considering those who are highly vulnerable to the virus. I've, I've heard that argument used, not, not here, but in other places before. How tempting it would be for those who haven't been vaccinated to shame the church for excluding them from being present at our church services. I've heard that argument used before in other settings as well. How tempting it would be for those who are vaccinated to claim entitlement to safety from being infected by others when present at church. I mean, surely we're entitled to that, aren't we? And how tempting it would be for those who are unvaccinated to claim entitlement to unrestricted access to church. Church should be available and open for anybody to come regardless of their vaccination status, shouldn't it? These are all arguments that lie at the heart of them lies a shaming of the other or, or our sense of entitlement of, of what should be our very own rights. Do you see how the friendship busters of shame and entitlement are threatening to bust apart many church friendships in this highly divisive period of our nation that we're, that we're living in right now. And I'm thankful that I haven't seen or heard so much of it within our church context, but I know of other churches who really are struggling with this big time, and it is threatening to pull those churches apart if they haven't done already. Whenever we're tempted into using shame and entitlement to manipulate others into doing what we want them to do, what we think they should do, remember the example of Jonathan, who resisted being shamed and entitled by his dad into breaking his friendship bond with David. And if he can do it way back then, that means we can do it today too. We can resist these friendship bond breakers of shame and entitlement with the help of God. The next morning, Jonathan took his servant boy with him to do some bow and arrow target practice. I guess that's what they did back then um, as, as a keep in training just in case they were attacked one day. And so off he went with a servant boy and he, he shot some arrows off into the field. And, uh, and it was the field where David was waiting and hiding to hear how things had gone between Jonathan and his dad. And after shooting off an arrow, Jonathan called out to his servant boy who had run off to retrieve it. Isn't the arrow beyond you? He called out. That was David and Jonathan's prearranged signal, communicating the bad news to David. That Jonathan's father, King Saul, was indeed out to kill him. Therefore David, it meant, would have to flee for his life before he was found. So after the servant boy had gone back with Jonathan's bow and arrows, David emerged from hiding and the two friends embraced each other, weeping together at what this would mean for their friendship and companionship. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness before you and me and between your, des your descendants and my descendants forever. He said, you see, never again would these two friends be able to enjoy each other's company. In their final moment together, Jonathan urged David to go in peace, a Hebrew expression of goodwill. For whenever friends or family were to be separated for an extended, or in Jonathan and David's case, for a permanent period of time. Although David and Jonathan would be physically separated from each other, Yet they would remain inseparably bonded together by the friendship oath that they'd sworn in the Lord's name. 
Nothing was going to separate them, not even their physical distance apart. What's more, their friendship bond would continue on from generation to generation forever because they were bonded together for intergenerational peace. This was the commitment that they'd made to each other. Later on, after Jonathan had, and his dad had been killed in battle and David became the next king of Israel, as, 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 as he was anointed to be, David fulfilled this friendship vow of intergenerational peace by including Jonathan's son Mephibosheth in his own royal household. When he could easily have had Mephibosheth killed to protect the Davidic dynasty, which was common practice back then for, for anyone that might be a threat to, to the royal lineage. But he didn't because of this covenant that he'd made with his best friend, Jonathan. Our examination of David and Jonathan's friendship has shown that their bond of loving kindness was strong enough to withstand their friendship breakers, the friendship breakers of shame and entitlement that threatened to tear them apart. And that although they became physically distanced from each other, yet their friendship remained intact because their friendship was forged for intergenerational peace from generation to generation this, their commitment would carry on. Now today is Waitangi Day. We've heard about that already from, from Anna. The day we remember the friendship treaty between, and I'm going to call it that because I think it is a friendship treaty, between the Queen of Britain, Queen Victoria it was at the time, and the Māori Rangatera, the chiefs of Aotearoa, New Zealand. A couple of months ago, I, I noticed on Facebook, occasionally I'll check, I probably should do it a bit more consistently, ch I check the messages um, that, that people sometimes put on our, our All Nations Facebook, Facebook page. And there I found a, a post by someone whom I've never met. His name's Rawiri Love. And there he posted a tribute to Henry Williams on our All Nations Facebook page. Henry Williams was one of the early missionaries who worked tirelessly to forge the friendship bonds of loving kindness and intergenerational peace between Māori and Pākehā. He also assisted with the, the Treaty of Waitangi so that friendship could be forged between Māori and Pākehā to bring intergenerational peace to our nation and intergenerational peace that, that we are the recipients of. So let me play you this short little video clip from his post. Kia ora koutou katoa. Well, here I am. I'm travelling from Kaikoi. I'm going back to Auckland. Just finished and accomplished a filming mission. And what should happen? This is a major tribute to the legacy of our history, national history of New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand, plus also to Māori in a big way. He was known as Four Eyes. He was staunch. When Iwi back then used to squabble and it would be not uncommon to find them looking to come to heads and he would be known as one who would stop them because he saw himself as a peacemaker, Henry Williams. Yes, he was there when there was the writing of the Treaty of Waitangi. So here we are. We are at the Holy Trinity, Pakaraka. That's where we are. The Holy Trinity, Pakaraka. And I've never been here, but I thought, I think Henry Williams might actually be buried here. <laughs> and uh, so here he is. Now, okay, he interpreted the English version of the treaty into Māori. 
So he was there to mediate and to lie ace between <coughs> England and Māori. They trusted him. So therefore they placed their confidence in him when he was there with the interpreting of the treaty so they were willing to be partners with our Pākehā race, our English people that first set foot here to be a part of this nation. And uh, when I think back, obviously the milestone of what this nation is today is because of the legacy that was pioneered by this man. Yes, the early missionary to Aotearoa. That's a known fact. Now, there could be some of you ready to throw stones at me. Because <laughs> you're thinking he was a prick, he was this, he was everything under there. We understand that. History does come with mummy. You know, there's wounds, there's, there was, you know, issues. What history doesn't? So, but the foundation stones were foundation stones, just that. The first Māori revival, this was the man that was involved. He was there as a major catalyst of that Māori revival. So David and Jonathan's friendship bond with each other and Henry Williams' friendship bond with Māori point to the kind of friendship bond that Jesus wants us to have with each other and the kind of friendship bond he wants to make with, with you and with me. Jesus said to his disciples, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And this is my command, love one another. Let's pray. Best friend Jesus, thank you that you call us your friends. As your friends, help us to obey your command to love each other the same way you love us. Bond us together with loving kindness so that we may become a church community that models intergenerational friendship, so that the world may see in us the kind of friendship you want to make with all peoples. Amen.